Hi, hello. In the previous video, we talked about the categorical distribution, in particular, the tabular representation of the categorical distribution. I'm going to revisit that very briefly here, just to make a, a slight generalization, and then discuss an alternative way to represent categorical distributions. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to work with a running example where I have a random variable w whose distribution I can determine conditioned on some on an assignment of some random variable h. And um, knowing this random variable h, so the outcome little h, I can instantiate the categorical distribution of w and the categorical parameters I'm gonna use a letter f um, is a function of the history and this function may have some parameters in it okay I changed things a little bit relative relative to last time but I'll explain it to you so first of all um, as, as maybe boldface doesn't work so clearly on, on, on my tablet, um, maybe I can... Well, I'll just try to, to go along. Let's see. Um, this f is not one real value. It is, in fact, a collection of uh, probability values. Um, let's say that w takes on outcomes in a set with v categories in it. You could think of w as a word and then v is a vocabulary size. And to which one of these uh, integers I associate a specific, a unique word in the vocabulary of a language. Maybe I mean by h what I mean is a history, uh, for example, in a language modeling application. But this is just an example. What matters is that we have a conditional probability distribution here. Now, if uh, the sample space of my random variable w will have uh, v categories in it, then f is a collection of v probability values, right? So there is f1, there is f2, all the way to fv. So I'm going to try to use kind of like a thicker f to indicate that there are uh, multiple coordinates to this sequence or vector. Um, each coordinate, each and every coordinate is a function of the history. And um, optionally, I may uh, consult a table of parameters or a collection rather, I want to use the word collection, a collection of parameters that I will name theta. And I'll show you that the tabular representation that we discussed last time fits this formalism very nicely. So let's talk about the tabular representation. In the tabular representation, I have a big table. Perhaps the name of that table is theta. Well, that's kind of how we looked at it in the past. Um, to which role of the table I'm going to associate uh, I'm going to associate each role of the table with a, uh, with a history that I, I know, with an assignment of the conditioning variable. And uh, there are columns for the outcomes, each possible assignment of the random variable w. So we know that we have, you know, v possible assignments. And h, well, I... I not going to write really how many there can be, but I'll give you examples. Maybe one is uh, beginning of sequence A, beginning of sequence N, beginning of sequence SUM, you know, and it could be anything really. Uh, maybe this is not even uh, specific to trigrams. Maybe some of these are, uh, you know, uh, A little kid, and it goes on. So what we know is that there are a number of known histories uh, for which I have associated, to which one of these histories I have associated uh, a sequence of probabilities. They are all probability values and together they adapt to one. 
Okay, so in the formalism that I started with, I would say a tabular representation is one where f is in fact a table lookup operation. Right, so essentially, um, once I know a history, let's say um, beginning of string sequence sum, I do a lookup, a table lookup operation, and I identify a row in this table which corresponds to age. Right, so this is my current age. And here I will find, uh, you know, F1 all the way to FV, the V probability values. Okay, so I hope this is clear. So I do a lookup, I retrieve the row, right? And I retrieve all V numbers in that thing, right? And that's basically, maybe I can spell them out just for clarity, I'm trying to make it super clear hopefully succeeding, right? And I can bring them all here. So all thetas in that row, all V thetas in that row. And this is my F. Now, why did I bother making this slight change, conceptual change? I want us to think of this as a mechanism to predict from the available history and potentially some parameters the v-dimensional probability vector that will fully prescribe your conditional probability distribution, in this case for w given a, an outcome of big H, the outcome small h. Now once we think of this as a mechanism to predict probability vectors from the conditioning information, we will be able to generalize this mechanism far beyond a table lookup and far beyond the tabular representation. So this is what I want to discuss next. Now what we're going to discuss next goes around by the name of the logistic representation of CPDs. Uh, in particular of categorical CPDs, so maybe I can say categorical CPDs. Recall CPDs, conditional probability distribution. Okay, so I'm going to copy the setting. Okay, so it's still the same setting. We have, uh, we will be predicting conditional distributions. These distributions will be of the categorical kind because the variable that we are trying to assign a distribution for to is a categoric, it takes on uh, categorical values in a set of V categories. Um, we'll be predicting the categorical distribution, essentially predicting the parameters of the probability mass function of this categorical random variable, the parameters being the probability value. So we'll be predicting the probability of each and every outcome of W under a specific condition. And we'll be predicting those probabilities from the condition itself possibly with the help of some parameter, some trainable statistical parameters. Okay, um, this time we are going to be using a different mechanism. So I'm going to spell this out. Instead of storing the conditional probability masses as we did before, for every outcome pair, right? so a uh, condition outcome pair, maybe I can write it this way, I think it would be a little clearer, condition outcome pair. Instead of doing that, we crucially predict the conditional probability masses. using, and here is the key, a log linear model. 
And that's where the logistic name comes from, actually. So how, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to introduce some machinery. We're going to need to introduce a notion, and that notion is called a feature function. Now, the feature function will do something very important for us. It will map an instance of the conditioning variable to a fixed dimension real coordinate space. So it will map from the set of any possible histories in this case to the d-dimensional real coordinate space. So let's pretend for a moment that um, I'm interested in only two dimensions, okay? So I can draw this. This is my real coordinate space of two dimensions. And maybe here is a history, uh, let's say, you know, a uh, uh, small bird. And here is perhaps another history, a different history. Uh, small rabbit, right? And then maybe um, my feature space corresponds to, each dimension corresponds to something quantifiable. For example, number of um, rodents, you know, and number of um, animals. I just chose these ones, okay? It could be anything. So my feature function is some algorithm that knows how to map this sequence to the number of animals in this thing, uh, the number of animals being one, and to the number of rodents in this thing being, well, zero. As for the other case, the same feature function will know to map to the number of animals in this thing, well, one, and the number of rodents in this thing, well, also one. So whereas here is our feature representation of small rabbit, over here we have our feature representation of uh, the tuple is small bird, right? So feature functions allow me to give a very uniform kind of treatment to arbitrary sequences of tokens in this case, which is what my conditioning information happens to be. In this example, this is two-dimensional, no, but of course, in reality, we're going to design feature functions that have many, many, many more uh, dimensions. But they're typically something like what I just sketched now. Uh, each coordinate of the feature function vector of the feature vector will quantify something that can be measured and, you know, represented with a real number. And you will do so for any conditioning information whenever you are confronted with uh, with a specific instance of it. Now, once we have a feature function in place, what can we do? I'm going to have to clean up a bit of the space here. Oh, actually, let me not clean up it. Let me just move it to the side so you can still use the drawing. Okay, um, the next thing we'll do is now that our conditioning information has been mapped to a point, each, each uh, instance of my con conditioning information, conditioning context has been mapped to a point, I will map those points to a different space. In particular, I'm interested in eventually having a vector with v probabilities in it, one for each of the possible outcomes of the random variable w. So from the feature vector of small bird, 
I'm going to compute one transformation that gives me a real number to put in here. With a different transformation, I will obtain a real number to put in here. With a different transformation, a real number to put in there, and so on and so forth, until I have all V real numbers. This transformation is very, sim very simple. I have a two-dimensional data point here. Right? I have a point in a two-dimensional space. And this is a point on the real line. This is another point on the real line, and so on and so forth. A linear transformation can do that. So if I have a, a, a vector w1 with two dimensions in it, or with as many dimensions as I have features, and I do a dot product with small bird, plus I add a scalar to it, I can obtain a real value. And I can do the same thing with a different parameter vector, W2, and a different bias. P2 and obtain the second coordinate of this other vector. And I can do that for each and every one of the words of the coordinates of this output vector. So for the last coordinate, I would be doing something like WV transpose small bird plus BV, where W1 is the dimensional like my feature function. Maybe I should write it here. Uh, my feature function is d dimensional. Um, w2 as well. And every one of the w's up until wv. And the b's, the b's are each scalars. So if I put all b's together, that makes a v-dimensional vector because we have v times uh, a total number v of scalars. These correspond to the parameters of my linear model that predict these things that will be related to the probabilities that we're looking for. They aren't the probabilities themselves. They aren't the probabilities because they aren't constrained to being probabilities. If you get a linear function and you transform a feature function, the feature vectors as I showed, uh, there is no guarantee that you will get a probability vector. These things may be largely positive, largely negative. To opt so we'll think of these things as scores, as a score vector. Some people like to call it a vector of logits or logits. To Turn a v-dimensional vector of scores into a vector inside of the probability simplex. Remember we talked about the probability simplex last time? It's just the name we give to the subset of real vectors that happen to have probabilities as coordinates and adapt one. To do that, we can use the very, very famous softmax transformation. There are others as well, but the softmax is one that we can use. A softmax is also going to be, a, the output of the softmax is also v-dimensional. I'm going to write what the coordinates look like. The ith coordinate of it is the exponentiated ith coordinated coordinate of the uh, score vector, normalized by the sum. of all exponentiated coordinates, okay? So it basically just makes sure that every coordinate is now a probability value and that together they adapt to one. So what I showed you here is a log linear model that goes from an H to a space of, well, in this case, handcrafted features. From that space, to logits through a linear model, and from logits to probabilities through the softmax function. 
no matter which age I give this model, provided that you know it can this age can be featureized, then the model can turn an age into a vector of v probabilities. The model will allow us to predict for any condition we are given the v-dimensional probability vector that we need to prescribe the conditional probability distribution of w given a small h. All right, so this is the logistic representation of a categorical CPD. Um, it is a very powerful technique, and I want to discuss a little bit with you why this is such a great idea. So for once, The model size does not depend on how many different instances of uh, H I expect to encounter. It really doesn't, right? The model size is basically a function of how many parameter vectors we have and how many biases we have and we have well v i apologize these are ooh. These are not v-dimensional. The parameter vectors are d-dimensional, like the feature function. And we have v of them, so v times d. And the bias vectors are, the biases are scalars. We can, and we have v of them. So the total model size is v times d plus one. So it's very compact, and it doesn't depend on the, on the cardinality of the set of all possible histories. Another reason why this is such a good idea is that histories, or more generally conditioning information, conditioning context, are no longer treated as unrelated to one another. They are in fact now related to each other through their features. So for example here, suppose I have something like cool, uh, cool dog, you know, cool cat, and cool day, right? And maybe my feature function is a number of occurrences of the word cool, number of occurrences of the word dog, number of occurrences of the word cat, number of occurrences of the word day, you know, and maybe I also have some other features like number of positive words, and maybe I have like number of animals. Maybe I have number of, uh, you know, phrases that contain a positive word and an animal in this order and so on and so forth. And I could have other things. And we would say that this cool dog is, well, there is a cool, there is a dog, there are no cats, there is no day. Cool is a positive word, I guess. A dog is an animal. And this is in fact an instance of a positive animal in this order. Um, and then, you know, cool, no dogs, one cat, no days, one positive, one animal. And yes, it's a phrase about positive animals. It's a positive phrase about an animal. And, um, you know, another cool, no dog, no cat, a day, positive, no animals. And no, it's not uh, an animal, a phrase, a positive phrase about animals. So you see that these things that would otherwise be treated as completely independently in a tabular representation, they're here treated as points in some space. And there is some notion of neighborhood, right? Like, so there is some notion of closeness. Um, these things are the same along at least this one dimension. And uh, these two phrases are the same, are similar along various dimensions. Right? And uh, this relatedness that the feature function captures is actually uh, a very, a, a, very big part of why um, logged in your models work and they find patterns that are much more subtle much more fine-grained 
than what you can um, code in a tabular representation of a CPD. Now I want to talk a little bit about estimation uh, and then give you a complete example. So how do we estimate the parameters, the W's and the B's of our log linear model? So as before, well, first of all, I give you some data. In this case, data will look like pairs where you have a, a conditioning variable, an assignment of the conditioning variable, and an assignment of the outcome variable. Um, you know, you always need to decide on a model. So our model is going to be uh, log linear. It will map from the history to uh, through a feature function. It will map histories to a vector of probability values of the correct dimensionality. So here w is uh, v by d. Uh, feature function is d-dimensional, the b is v-dimensional, so the softmax output is of course v-dimensional, and f is then, the output of f is of course v-dimensional, and through this algorithm here, through this parametric function, um, our model predicts from any history uh, a complete categorical probability mass function. To learn the parameters, well, we will initialize them somewhat, uh, right? and then we will assign, we'll compute the log likelihood of the parameter vector given the available data, and that is going to be the, due to IID assumptions, the log of the probability mass associated with each observed outcome in each observed context uh, as a function of theta. And, well, we know this is going to be something like uh, the log of uh, the f transformation of each one of the hn's. Uh, well, we want a specific coordinate. We want coordinate wn. And if I wanted to write it to spell out completely, then this would be the log of the softmax of w phi h plus b. Um, assessed uh, hn, right? Assessed for the corresponding observed co uh, for the coordinate that corresponds to the observed outcome of the variable w. Now it turns out that um, this is in fact for this class of model this curve has a, gl a global optimum. Uh, so I'm going to pretend this is a single parameter, right? If there was a single parameter, the curve would look more or less like this. And um, this curve has an optimum at a point where the partial der the derivative of the curve with respect to theta is zero. So if we attempt to solve this equation, what is the theta? whose gradient of the log likelihood of theta will be zero, um, we'll see that we do not have a closed form solution like we had for the tabular CPD, but we can count on an iterative procedure. And that iterative procedure looks like the following. Um, we start with some uh, collection of thetas at time step t, and then we um, use that collection to compute to us compute the log likelihood, and then we obtain gradients with respect to that collection of parameters, and this will give us an update. So if you're looking for an updated collection of parameters, well, you get your current parameter and assign your log likelihood. You Compute the partial derivatives with respect to each and every one of your parameters. The collection of those partial derivatives is a gradient. You scale those gradients by uh, a so-called learning rate, and there are some conditions on what the thing should look like. 
and then you move your current gradient, uh, your current parameter set in the direction of the gradient. And that will give you a new uh, parameter set. And this algorithm works by essentially something like this. So if you are here, maybe this is your theta one, uh, in the next step, you're gonna be somewhere higher. Maybe this is your theta two, and then you're somewhere higher, this is theta three. And at one point you will be here, maybe this is your theta 100, and it never goes lower than that, so it doesn't go down. It, it's only allowed to go up, so it will converge at an optimum. Now, I wanted to give you a complete example of this. But because there are so many computations, I need a feature function, I need to do matrix multiplications, I need to apply a soft max, I need to obtain derivatives, and none of that is done by hand anymore. Um, I will walk you through an example on a Colab notebook, okay? And I'll do that in a moment. So I'll catch up shortly.